Hey guys, welcome to the video on the genome and how it kind of relates to evolution. I have three goals for this lesson today. First, I want you guys to understand what bioinformatics is and how it's being used in genome research. Secondly, I want you guys to, be able to describe the eukaryotic genome and its non-coding regions. And finally, I want you guys to, to explain why the genome is constantly changing and how we can use this to determine ancestry. So some basic terms, guys, I have to go over with before I actually begin to explain this topic. The first one is something called genomics. This is basically the study of whole genomes and how they interact. So, so far, guys, we've only been looking at single genes. We've been looking at single genes one at a time and seeing, okay, this gene makes this protein and so far. What genomics does is, genomics attempts to find out what all the genes do and how all the proteins interact. As you hope I can guess, this is super hard, and we are nowhere close to being done with this area of biology. But the goal is am admirable, and they're giving it a pretty good effort right now. But the problem here comes down to is you get all this information, you find all the genes, all the proteins, it's a lot of work. So what one scientist are beginning to do right now is they're beginning to do something called bioinformatics. This is basically using computer science and data management to organize genome research. So basically they're using computers and databases and fancy search engines to begin to put all this computer information online so that they can store it and easily access it. Basically they're forming a Google for the human genome and other organisms genome. Now one of the main goals behind this has been what's called the Human Genome Project, which was finished a couple of years ago. The Human Genome Project's goal was to find every single gene in the human body and then find out what it did. The answer is yes, they managed to pull it off. Um, I do want you to know the process behind this because it's actually a little bit interesting and you might see it on the AP exam, but I really feel like I can't explain it very well compared to some of the TED Talk videos I've seen. So. At this point in time, guys, if you're watching this video, please go ahead and pause this and watch the TED Ed video that comes with this folder. If you are in the other classroom, well, I don't know why you're watching the video. I'm the one giving the lecture right now. Okay, so here's some key ideas for the genome project. Okay, so you watch the information. You know how they cut the DNA up and they figured out how every single letter was through a series of different sequencing techniques. The problem here comes down to, though, is, is that they need to then take this DNA and then find out where the DNA, where the DNA went to genes. Well, they had two ways they can do this. The first one here is called a linkage map. A linkage map is basically a map of where genes are on the chromosome. This was put together before we had the ability to sequence DNA, and its biggest weakness was is, is that it was all about relative distance. It was not an exact location. We are mostly guessing is the problem. We were guessing, but we were guessing accurately with a linkage map. So the linkage map was a way to give us a basic idea about where genes are located, but it wasn't the best technique because it didn't give us the exact location. The Human Genome Project gave us something that was called a physical map. A physical map is the exact map of the chromosome. Basically, it's where every single gene is located, and how it works. There's not really a good picture for this one, unfortunately, guys. The reality is, is that it's just a map of the chromosome showing where every gene is located. The difference here is, is just accuracy. If a linkage map just says that the eye color gene is close to the height genes, the physical map actually says that the um, eye color genes are 10 base pairs away from the height genes. It gives you an exact number, whereas this is more about kind of a guess. This comes down to an interesting idea here, guys. Once you have a physical map of the chromosome and you know where things are located, you can do something called metagenomics. Metagenomics is when you take the DNA of multiple species and you compare them together. And we'll come back to this topic at the end of this presentation. And it's going to talk about how we can compare the DNA of different species to find out which proteins are really important and which ones maybe not so much. And finally, there's one idea here called gene annotation. This is basically the identifying of all the protein coding regions in the genome and what they code for. It's a fancy way of saying they want to find out where, what genes make for what proteins. That's what gene annotation is. Okay, now that we've got some of the more of the basic key terms of, out of the way, 
there were some problems that came with the Human Genome Project that we have to kind of discuss. Um, the first thing we kind of figured out was is that a lot of genes in the human genome do more than one thing. It's not one gene, one job. One gene can be more than one protein because of things like introns and exons. It makes things really complicated. Other things is that the Human Genome Project didn't really tell us how gene regulation went. It just told us how genes, where all the bases are, and give us where all the actual genes are, but it didn't tell us how does the body control gene regulation, which we thought this was really simple. Unfortunately, the Human Genome Project showed us that, holy buckets, it's actually really hard. We don't really know how the body regulates everything. The final one is, is that some genes can code for thousands of different proteins. The best example here is the immune system. That's like basically two or three genes, but it's able to make, I think the answer is like 10 to the power of 10 different proteins, which is like, how does that one, how does those three genes make so many different proteins? The answer is introns and exons. But unfortunately, we don't quite know how introns and exons work yet. So even though we have the entire map of the human genome, we don't really understand how the intron exon system works yet. So that was one of the problems. The solution to this problem is what they're now working on, the current project in biology. This is called proteomics. The idea here is that we now have the entire DNA sequence of the human genome. We now need to find out what all the proteins the human genome can make. Because the DNA is not all the proteins because of introns and exons. So now scientists are looking at proteomics. Proteomics is trying to find out all the proteins involved. This has been a lot harder. If the Human Genome Project took us four years and millions of dollars in research, the proteomic is probably going to take us decades because there's just so much going on here we don't understand. And unfortunately, there's a lot here we're currently working on and understanding. We're getting better at it, and as computers get faster, we're getting better at understanding how all the proteins work and how the introns and exons work, but we've got a long way ahead of us, guys. Unless we get quantum computers here soon, it's going to be a real long time before we figure out where the proteomic genome. So with that in sense, guys, I want to go ahead and talk about something that a problem with the human genome and other genomes. If we look at the number of genes, so here we have the number of genes inside of different organisms. So for example, E. coli has 4,400 genes. Um, funguses have 6,000 genes. Nematode is a worm, basically. Worms have 20,000 genes. Um, a mustard plant, which is basically mustard plants, is going to be like broccoli, cauliflower, and the ones that make flour, they have 27,000 genes. Drosophila is going to have 13,000 genes. Going on down, looking at some more of them, we've got um, rice has 42,000 genes. Corn, 32,000 genes. There's a lot of genes here, a whole bunch of them. Let's go ahead and end things up with the humans. Humans have 21,000 genes. The problem here comes down to is we have 21,000 genes. We have lots of DNA and not a lot of genes. We have three points, we have three billion bases in our genome, and we have 21,000 genes. When we do the math on this, we do all the research, we find out that only 1.5% of our DNA actually turns into mRNA. That's a huge problem, actually. That shows us that we have the entire code for our DNA, but only 1.5% of that actually does something that we understand in terms of making DNA. What the heck is the rest of it doing? And that's what I want to talk about now is what is the rest of the DNA happening? Because what is happening here? We don't really understand it, and it does give us some questions. Well, let's go ahead and talk about what we do know. Well, the first one is something called pseudogenes. Pseudogenes are genes that have been turned off. So humans have 21,000 genes, but we have more than that. The thing is, is that evolution has turned off a lot of these genes, so they're no longer working. For example, humans still have a gene that creates a tail, but last time I checked, nobody here actually has a tail that I've ever seen. That's because the tail gene has been turned off, and we don't grow tails anymore. Um, the best example, though, is your sense of smell, guys. 
Um, there are over 1,000 genes that code for a sense of smell. So most animals have these 1,000 genes turned on, but humans are kind of weird here because, guys, I got bad news for you. About 54% of this 1,000 genes don't work in humans anymore. They've been turned off. So if we had all of our smell genes turned on, we would have 21,500 genes, not 21,000 genes. All of our smell genes, guys, have been turned off, or half of them have been turned off. That means there's actually quite a few things, guys, that we can't smell. There are things in the air that we don't know are there because our body has turned off those genes, and as a result, we don't actually sense those things. Our sense of smell is terrible, and it's because of this. We have pseudogenes that have been turned off and no longer work. So this accounts for a small amount of our DNA, but obviously a thousand genes is still not very much. If you consider that 1.5% of our genome is 21,000 genes, then adding a thousand genes here and there for different things that we are no longer using would still only add up to about 2% of the genome. So pseudogenes are there, but they're still not a big deal. Moving on to regulatory sequences. These are going to be your operons, your transcription factors, your regulatory proteins. Well, this is about 20% of your genome. So this gives us about 21.5% 20, of our genome as we know about so far. So 20% is basically just regulation. And these are basically binding points for transcription factors and other situations like that, promoter sequences and other things we've talked about in the previous chapters. So that gives us 20% of our genome, or 21.5%, but it's still a whole bunch missing. Here's where the rest of it comes in, in something called transposable elements. DNA that moves around the chromosome. This caught us off guard as biologists. We didn't actually know this was happening, and it's kind of weird that it does. There's DNA on our chromosome that's constantly moving around, which means it's actually jumping from chromosome to chromosome, or it's jumping around the same chromosome. So we have DNA that just kind of moves around, and we don't really know why it's there. Over 44% of our genome, of our DNA, is transposable elements. It's part of our DNA that just bounces around the, DNA, the chromosome, and we really don't know what it does. Um, it comes in two types. There are transposons and retrotransposons. The difference here is that transposons are going to be transposable elements that move around the DNA, but they stay as DNA the entire time. They just turn into DNA, and they've been attached to another part of the chromosome, and then they jump to that part of the chromosome. The second kind is called a retrotransposon. What this one here does is, it turns into mRNA first, and then using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, it turns back into DNA. So somehow, part of our, G our DNA goes from DNA, that's a terrible D, DNA, then it goes to RNA, and finally goes back to DNA. But when it goes back to DNA, it attaches to a brand new location where it wasn't before. This is really weird. These were discovered, I would say, back in the 90s, and we're kind of beginning to figure out what they are, but we're still a little bit unsure about why we have so much DNA that's moving around the chromosome, but it definitely doesn't. Now, we haven't quite reached 100% yet. We've gotten to about 60%. Well, we have a lot of DNA that's called simple sequence DNA. These are basically short repeats of the same few bases. So basically, you have between 15 and 200 bases, they're just copies of the same thing. So you might have like A, 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 and then maybe T, 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 and it repeats over and over and over again like this. It doesn't do anything, it just seems to be there. Now we also have something called short tandem repeats, which are, which are an example of simple sequence DNA, but here what's happening here is that in this case, it's just two or five bases in length. So basically what happens here is you have the same two or five bases that repeat hundreds, if not thousands of times. Yeah, it's confusing, guys. Our DNA makes no sense. We really don't understand why a lot of this is in place. Like, what's the point of simple sequence DNA? What's the point of short tandem repeats? 
Right now, guys, we're trying to figure this out as biologists, but we don't, as far as I know, we don't have the answer. Maybe someone's come up with it in the last couple of years. I didn't know about it, but as of right now, I haven't seen any information. So let's take a look at the final percentages of what we know about. Well, 44% of our DNA, as I pointed out, is going to be transposable elements. So we have almost half our DNA is basically DNA that bounces around. 1.5% is actually coding regions. 5% um, of it is introns. And remember, introns are the mRNA that gets removed. We have 20% is in regulation. Here we have 15% in what's called unique non-coding DNA. This is basically going to be either DNA that we don't quite know what it does, but it's just constantly doing other weird things. The large segment duplications, that's going to be your simple sequence DNA, and you have your other things. So, that's our DNA. Most of our DNA is transpose of elements. The other big part of it is regulation. So 64% of our DNA is transposable bell elements and regulation. It's a weird genome, guys. Our DNA is not as simple as we thought it was. It's a very complicated thing, and frankly speaking, we are still trying to figure out how all of this works. So if you want to hop into biology and you want to be part of the people who help try to solve this mystery, please go for it, because we need more people working on this. It is something that we need to learn to understand. So let's hop on into a topic, guys. Let's talk about DNA and evolution. Most differences between species, guys, is not in our DNA. It's in our chromosomes. Our chromosomes are what oftentimes change between species. Here's an example right here between humans and chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are our closest ancestors on Earth right now. They are our closest common ancestor. What we have here is we have a human chromosome 2 on the left, and we have human, the chimpanzee chromosome um, 12 and 13 on the right. What we've discovered as biologists is that sometime in our evolutionary history, the chimpanzee chromosome merged together, and these two chromosomes merged together and created the human chromosome number two. So somewhere in our ancestors, when humans and chimpanzees split apart, it split apart because our ancestors had the chromosome merged together. So we have literally a telomere-like sequence, which is this orange part here. And if you look carefully, there's an orange part here on the chromosome. Basically what happened, guys, is the difference between chimpanzees and humans is simply stated that the chimpanzee chromosome 12 and 13 combined together and created the human chromosome number 2. And that's the reason why humans and chimpanzees have a different number of chromosomes, is simply because of what you see right here. And most animal differences, guys, is this right here. There is not a lot of DNA differences between different animals, um, especially very closely related animals. It's why you can make hybrid animals like the liger and the um, half, half horse, half zebra, is oftentimes there's not a lot of difference between the organisms and what does exist is in the chromosomes. But, we can use this information to find out how closely related we are in evolution. So we can look and see if this is a picture representation of the human chromosome and we then compare it to the chimpanzee chromosome, what we see is that it's pretty closely related. This part here is the same, this part here is the same. It's almost entirely the same. The only real difference happens right here, which is on that chromosome 2 versus chromosome 13 and 14. So the DNA of a chimpanzee and a, chromos chimpanzee and a human is not really all that different. There's only one major difference. We are pretty closely related. But if we begin to go to our next ancestor, the gorilla, we can look and see that, okay, there are some more differences that have begun to appear. The DNA is still going to be getting more this is, for example, the gap that exists here doesn't exist here in the gorilla chromosome. And we go farther back to the orangutan, well, now we begin to see a lot more DNA differences. This guy here is called comparative genomics. Basically, this is part of the metagenomics I mentioned before. We can look at the DNA of different animals and we can compare them together. And we can align them and see how much alignment is there between the two species. And that lets us know how closely related we are in terms of evolution. 
So we can look at the DNA of two animals, and the more similar their DNA is, the more closely related they are in ancestry. The more farther apart related they are, the more differences we begin to see. This is called comparative genomics, and it's a way for us to actually find out how closely related animals are to each other. And guys, that's basically it. Thank you for going and watching this presentation. Hope this stuff made sense for you, and I will see you guys.